Well, hello and welcome to the third video or fourth lecture about ion channels given by uh, the lecture is given by Professor Pani and let's do it. First of all, what is an ion channel? What is the definition of an ion channel? Ion channels are proteins along the membrane which help the movement of ions down their electrochemical gradient so whenever we're talking about channels again whenever we're talking about channels we're talking about the passive movement of ions so we have the movement of ions from a greater electrochemical gradient to a lesser electrochemical gradient and there is no use of energy how do these channels work? What is the mechanism? What is the mechanism of these ion channels gating? Well, first of all, there is an appropriate trigger which causes a conformational change within these proteins, these ion channels. What do we mean by appropriate trigger? Well, appropriate trigger can, for example, be a ligand molecule. A ligand molecule can, can come along and just binds to this closed ion channel and binding of this ligand molecule can cause a conformational change in the channel which makes it open. Another trigger can be a potential difference in the membrane or a voltage. So when the voltage reaches the ion channel, it makes the ion channel to undergo a conformational change and be open. Another type of gating can be mechanical stress. When the channels are under mechanical stress, they can be open or closed. For example, when the membrane is stretched. So the appropriate trigger, which we just talked about, causes a conformational change in the protein, which is the channel. And that leads to a transition between different conducting and non-conducting states. Now, the conducting state is the open state, but the non-conducting state can be either closed state or inactivate state. And what is the difference between closed and inactivated state is that in closed state, when a channel, when a ligand or a voltage or appropriate trigger, which we talked about, comes along the closed channel can be open, but when the channel is in an activated form, even if it's triggered, it will not be open. So that is the difference between a closed and an inactivated uh, state of channels. Now let's talk about different types of channels. As you guessed by now, channels are categorized to four types by the triggers. Uh, voltage gated, like for example sodium or potassium channels. Well, if you remember from biophysics when we are having a action potential. Ligand gated ion channels like nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which we will talk about. And intracellular signal uh, gated. Now, what's the difference between the intracellular signal gated or the intracellular ligand gated channels with the ligand gated channels is that the, the ligand, the, the trigger which makes the channel activated, is coming from within the cell. Or uh, to be more specific, it's a second messenger. The, the, there was a first messenger, there was a first signal which caused a reaction in the cell which led to the production of a second messenger in the cell and that second messenger now causes the alteration in the channel. So that's the difference between intracellular signal gated and ligand gated. And then we have a stretch gated um, ion channels like for example chloride stretch gated ion channel. And ion channels can also be subcategorized based on their selectivity. Now as we know the passage of one or some ion species are allowed through a channel. It's not like if a channel opens, 
any random uh, ion species can go through. There are specific domains in the channels called um, uh, selective domains, which uh, which lets the passage of specific uh, ion species. Now we have highly selective ion channels, which, as you can see, their ion conduction pore is formed by four subunits. So four subunits. And the examples are potassium, sodium, calcium, chloride ion channels. So basically, any channel with the name of ion on it is a highly selective ion channel. When we say calcium channel, when we say chloride channel, these are highly selective. Then we've got mildly selective ion channels, like nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which we're going to talk about. And as you can see, its ion conduction pore unit is formed of five subunits. That's the difference. You see, four or five. And in case of non-selective or gap junction channels, well, gap junction, uh, gap junctions, as you will study in uh, histology, they let the passage of any charged particle as long as they weigh less than 2,000 Daltons. And as you can see, their ion conduction pore consists of six subunits. Now, to be to go more to talk more about the, the structure of these ion channels, we need to know about one more thing because we already talked about the pore region of ion channels as you can see in this two-dimensional depiction the pore region which uh, which uh, the, its number the, the subunits of pore region differ the uh, differs in the different type of channels consists of a selectivity filter which makes the channel selective toward different species we talked about these two now what is a voltage sensor so the example we're talking about is a voltage gated calcium uh, potassium channel so voltage sensors only exist in voltage gated ion channels and they are protein domains which are formed by alpha helical uh, which are alpha helical domains and these alpha helical protein domains are formed by positively charged amino acids and when uh, a voltage reaches these domains these domains will undergo a structural rearrangement and the structural rearrangement of these domains will lead, will cause eventually to the conformational uh, changes within the whole protein, within the channel, which causes the opening or closure or inactivation of the channel. Okay, now let's talk about the regulation of these ion channels by subunits and enzymes. Now, there are three types of regulations mentioned in the lecture, which only one of them is very important, and that's G-protein, but I'm going to mention all of them anyway. So the first one, as you can see, is the regulation of ion channels by subunits. For example, in the skeletal muscle calcium channel, you can see there are different subunits regulating the influx of calcium, especially the beta subunit, which is responsible for the, uh, the, 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 the current, the calcium current, which enters the cell. So in case of any mutations, we'll have very severe alterations or decrease in the calcium current. I don't think you need to know much more about this one. And we go to the next one. Another type of regulation of channels is by phosphorylation. And that is, I think, what you all know. Uh, and the, the very definition of phosphorylation, I think you all know again, it's uh, the addition of a phosphate group. And the enzyme which performs phosphorylation or attaches these phosphate groups are called they're called kinases and the enzymes which perform dephosphorylation or detachment of these phosphate groups are called phosphatases but the third and the most important type of uh, regulation ion channel regulation we're gonna talk about right now 
it is regulation by the G protein. And the example is muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Another name for it is metabotropic acetylcholine receptor. So muscarinic or metabotropic acetylcholine receptor. Now this picture here is not uh, is not very uh, intuitive, but we're gonna make sense of it right now. So first of all, we're talking about a regulation by a G protein, and to be more specific, by a G protein coupled receptor. So first of all, we're gonna have our acetylcholine, which plays as ligand here. So our acetylcholine comes and binds to its receptor, to its acetylcholine metabotropic or muscarinic receptor. This receptor is a type of G protein coupled receptor. It's also referred as serpentine domain because it looks like a snake. And when the acetylcholine binds to this G protein coupled receptor, which is a metabotropic acetylcholine receptor, it will be activated. And this receptor will transduce the signal to a G protein. In this case, it's a heterotrimeric G protein like this, which is inactive right now. Okay, it's inactive right now. The signal hasn't reached it yet. And the heterotrimeric G protein consists of three subunits. An alpha subunit, which, as you can see, is bound with a GDP, and a beta and a gamma subunit. Now, when the signal is transduced to this uh, G protein, the alpha subunit will exchange its uh, will exchange its GDP with a GTP, as you can see here. So this picture, the first one, is when the G protein is activated. It's like a while after the activation of G protein. So the alpha subunit, when exchange when exchanges GDP with GTP, will separate from beta gamma subunit. And when that happens, beta gamma subunit moves along the membrane because keep in mind these G proteins are membrane bound enzymes. The beta gamma subunit moves along the membrane and activates a potassium channel. And when the potassium channel is activated, we will have the potassium leaving the cell because the concentration of potassium in the cell is greater than the, the electrochemical gradient actually, it's more accurate, the electrochemical gradient of the potassium outside the cell. So potassium will leave the cell and what happens is if you remember from biophysics hyperpolarization inside the cell will be more negative and in, if and if you're talking about for example a cell uh, in heart, a heart muscle cell, that hyperpolarization causes the slowing of heartbeat and when this alpha subunit hydrolyzes its GDP to GDP again, the beta gamma subunit will come back and will reattach to its alpha subunit and will uh, go back to its inactive form. And that is the end of signaling. And that is the third and the most important type of regulation in ion channels. Okay, now that we've talked about metabotropic or muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, now we're going to talk about ionotropic or nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, this blue thing here, which can be found at the, at the neural junction, uh, at the neuromuscular junction. This one is a neuron, this one is a muscle. So the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor can be found at the neuromuscular junction in the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. But before we we can talk about this, acet uh, this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor or ionotropic acetylcholine receptor, first we have to talk about chemical synapse. And by the way, we have two type of synapses. We have chemical and electrical. After we've talked about chemical synapses and ionotropic acetylcholine receptor, we're going to talk about electrical synapse and compare it to the chemical synapse. So now let's start with defining a chemical synapse. A chemical synapse is a special junction between a nerve cell and another type of cell. 
So the first cell or presynaptic cell have to be a nerve cell. And the second cell or postsynaptic cell can either be another nerve cell or another type of cell. As you can see in this example, it's a skeletal muscle cell. So, this is a chemical synapse. Now, what happens first is that there will be an action potential generated in the presynaptic cell or in the nerve cell. And this action potential causes the depolarization of the nerve cell. Now, this depolarization causes activation of a specific type of calcium channel, a voltage-gated calcium channel. And then we'll have influx of calcium into the nerve cell. And this influx of calcium causes the exocytosis of these neurotransmitters which are within this physical. So the exocytosis, as I mentioned in the previous video, is when a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and it extrudes its containing to the extracellular matrix. In our example, these neurotransmitters are acetylcholine. So we have the depolarization, cal uh, the voltage-gated calcium channel opens, calcium rushes in the exocytosis of the vesicle. Now, these neurotransmitters or acetylcholines in our example enter the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is a space between presynaptic and postsynaptic cells. And they pass through these neurotransmitters or acetylcholines pass through this synaptic cleft and they bind with the ionotropic acetylcholine receptor or nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now what happens if you remember we said nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is an example of a mildly selective ion channel. So it has got five subunits in its conduction in its ion conduction pore. It has got five subunits. Two of these subunits, two of the subunits of ionotropic acetylcholine receptor are for the binding to these neurotransmitters. So two of these neurotransmitters bind to two of the five subunits of each ionotropic acetylcholine receptor. And this binding causes the conformational change of the whole ionotropic acetylcholine receptor and opening of it. And when it opens, since it is a mildly selective ion channel, it allows the passage of several types of ions, potassium, sodium, and calcium. The, the thing, the, the ion flow, which is most important here, is the ion flow of sodium. So sodium rushes in the cell and makes the cell positive. And that's very important in case of a skeletal muscle. So that was chemical synapse. And what is an electrical synapse? It is a type of synapse in which electrical impulse is transmitted rapidly due to free passage of ions. So we have free passage of ions. And when we say ions, we mean a lot of ions, a, a variety of species of ions. So the, uh, the ion channels responsible for electrical synapse, they need to be non-selective, or as we said, they need to be gap junctions. So we have gap junctions in electrical synapses, and an example of chemical uh, synapse we just talked about. So what's the difference between the electrical synapse and the chemical synapse? As you should guess by now, uh, in case of electrical synap synapses, we've got a nearly instantaneous uh, uh, the electrical impulse transmission. Uh, the, the example given here is in goldfish, but the example which makes more sense is in case of heart, uh, is in case of specific junctions 
in the uh, uh, heart muscle cells because we need intense and rapid uh, muscle contraction in case of our heart muscle cells and that is where we have a lot of these gap junctions and uh, on the other hand the advantage of chemical synapse is its signal amplification and computation well signal amplification it completely makes sense because imagine one neuron can cause the contraction of a lot of muscle cells and that is what we don't have in case of electrical synapse and computation the in, in case of chemical synapses because of all that uh, uh, the, the whole mechanism we have the, the synapse is more regulated uh, so we're gonna uh, in places like in neurons when uh, the, the processes like thinking and perceiving are happening, we need these type of synapses. And one more thing about inotropic or nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is its antagonist and agonist. I think you already know what an agonist or an antagonist means, but again, agonists are those molecules which activate the channel while antagonists are those molecules which do not activate but they bind to these uh, uh, channels and they do not let the agonist bind to them. So, for example, in case of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the agonists are acetylcholine and nicotine. If they bind, these channels will open, will be activated. The antagonist, in the other hand, is crura or Indian arrow poison. When crura is bound to these uh, uh, channels, it will not activate these channels. So these channels are closed. But if acetylcholine or nicotine are now released, they also cannot be bound uh, to these channels. So the, uh, the signal transmission will not occur. And that can be pretty fatal for example, in case of uh, heart muscle cells. Now, channelopathy. There's only one thing here that, that I think you need to memorize, and that is one example. Either autoantibodies against uh, nicotinic acetylcholine or myasthenia gravis. I think it's better to memorize myasthenia gravis. I memorized it, and it came up in my exam. The... It causes skeletal muscle weakness. And, uh, well, what is the, the, the definition of a channelopathy? It is when we have loss of function or gain of function in our channels due to mutation in the genes coding them. So, that is pretty easy. And synapses can also be divided into two other type of categories excitatory or inhibitory now what's the difference between an excitatory or an inhibitory uh, type of channel uh, type of synapse is that uh, the excitatory ones they try to promote the action potential the the occurrence of action potential within the cell so if we have excitatory synapse going or working there would be a higher chance of action potential why because the in there would be an influx of positively charged ions or there would be an efflux of negatively charged ions so inside the cell the cytosol will be more positive and the chance of action potential will be higher whereas in case of, in case of inhibitory uh, these synapses will cause the influx of negatively charged uh, species uh, ion species or efflux of positively charged species so inside the cell the cytosol will be more negative the chance of action potential will be lower and the examples uh, so uh, the, the ion selectivity of each of each of these type of channels should be pretty obvious by now in case of 
excitatory, we should have uh, ion selectivity for positive ions. So when the channels open, positive ions like sodium can come in and make uh, the, 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 the cytosol more positive. And in case of inhibitory uh, receptors, uh, we should have the, the ion selectivity for negative, like chloride ions. And the examples that I think are important are the GABA receptor, which is ligand is, well, GABA, and acetylcholine and glutamate receptor. So I didn't memorize serotonin and glycine, but if you want to memorize them, go ahead and uh, do it. There would be no harm. So now, now that we've talked about ionotropic receptor and its example, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and metabotropic receptors and uh, example, uh, uh, muscarunic acetylcholine receptor, what is the difference between these receptors? Well, first of all, ionotropic receptors, they are ion channels themselves. So the ionotropic acetylcholine receptor is an ion channel itself with five subunits, which two of them are for the binding with acetylcholine. Whereas in case of metabotropic receptors, the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor itself is not an ion channel, but it's a receptor. But at the end, it will cause the activate. Uh, it, it will cause activation of an ion channel. If you remember, potassium ion channel, and in case of their function, ionotropic receptors act very fast, but their effects uh, uh, last very short. And in case of metabotropic, it's the opposite. They act slowly, but they last longer. And that is, well, uh, somehow common sense, because when we have a, a metabotropic receptor, uh, there was, there's a pathway to go. It's not like acetylcholine binds the receptor and right, right away the, uh, uh, the ion channel opens. There's a pathway, so it, it will make the whole process slower. But, well, on the other hand, the effects will, long last, uh, will uh, last longer. And that is about the differences between ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Now, there is one thing here about KATP channel that I talked about it in the previous lecture. I pretty much uh, covered everything about it. So if you don't know it, I recommend going back and watching that. And now there is only one more thing to talk about, and that is the implications of these, uh, of how can we use these ion channels in, in our benefits. Uh, one example is in uh, is uh, local anesthetics. Local anesthetics block sodium channels. And why do you think is that? Because in uh, the very first step of action potential, if you remember, is the opening of sodium channels. So, so uh, sodium ions can influx, can rush into the cell, make the cell positive, so that the action potential can occur, so that these nerve cells, these neurons, can transduce the signal. So if these channels are blocked, the signal cannot be transduced, including pain signals. So when you go to a dentist and when he uses anesthetics, it makes these uh, sodium channels uh, on that area to be uh, blocked, and so neurons cannot send, uh, can, uh, cannot be activated. The, the action potential will not occur, so they won't send pain signals. Another use of these uh, the sodium blockers are in case of antiarrhythmic actions for heart muscle cells, which it also the calcium uh, channel blockers are used in the antiarrhythmic actions. But calcium channel blockers are also va uh, vasodilators. Vasodilator, as you will study in histology, means uh, the thing which dilates vessels. So using of calcium will cause dilation of vessels, and that's used uh, when a patient has got uh, these calcium channel blockers are used when the patient has got hypertension. And 
sedative and anti-anxiety agent, I wouldn't and I didn't memorize CNS, but I memorized GABA uh, as it was also an example of inhibitory uh, type of uh, synapse. So the stimulation uh, the, of this uh, GABA receptor it, uh, will cause a sedative, um, will cause a sedation uh, uh, form. And uh, if the, the, this channel is open more frequently or is open longer, that would have a, uh, a greater sedative action. And that is pretty much it about this lecture. See you in the other one.